I want to continue talking about answering life's toughest questions, questions you never even thought to ask. But before I begin, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I just thank you that you're here with us today. I thank you, Father, that you're going to open up each one of our ears to hear more about you this morning, Father, that um, you're going to, um, that we're going to receive from you uh, new revelation as to who you are, and Father, that we will um, just go home strengthened and encouraged, Father. We thank you for doing these things in advance, and I just ask, Father, that you would just reveal yourself to each person that's here today in a fresh new way. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So last week, we said There are questions that we need to ask that we've never even thought of asking. We we might not even be aware of what these questions are, but we also said it's critical that we have the right answer to these questions. We also said that for these questions that we're going to talk about, truth is not subjective. There is a right and a wrong answer. And if you get the answer wrong, it will take you to a very different place than if you get the answer right. For these questions, you don't want to get the answers wrong. It's important that you get them right because if you get them right, your life will be a lot more blessed than if you don't. Okay? So the first question we asked last week was, what is real? What is real in this world? And we said the answer to that question really is God and his kingdom. And we want to take on another question this morning, and that is who is well off or blessed in this life? Did you ever wonder who really is well off and blessed? Is it someone who is powerful? Is it someone who is famous? Someone who is healthy? You know, it depends a lot on your situation that you're in right now, right? It would be if you're not healthy at the moment, you would think that all you need in life is to be healthy. If you're um, in a situation where you're being a victim for a bit, you know, for you to have more power would be what you want. But let's just continue with the list. Who is blessed? Is it the person who wins the lottery? And I don't mean 10 bucks or another free ticket. (laughs) Is it someone who lives on a beach and at night they can hear the waves crashing in? That's my dream, by the way. Is it a person who has a great, fulfilling job? They make lots of money and at the end of every day they feel like they've really accomplished something. Is it a person who has a great family? A man and a woman and four kids. I had a study, uh, I read a study quite a while ago and it said that families with four children are the happiest. So some of you guys need to get going quickly. (laughs) You know, is a person who is blessed, a person who's given their life to the service of others, maybe a missionary in a third world, You know, are these things that we should be aiming for in life? Are these things the things that we should be striving for? And you know, for each thing I've I've listed too, it would be good, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you are any of these things, or if you are all of these things, your life still will not be what it can be. A person who has experienced these things will is blessed, But it's not the ultimate thing. What is the ultimate thing? Who is well off or blessed? It's a person who enters the kingdom of God. Someone who is engaged in the kingdom of God. Someone who is entering the eternal life that Jesus had provided for them. And of course we're um, not talking about living forever. We're talking about experiencing real life now. I'm talking about living supernaturally. You see, this person who has entered the kingdom of God, who's experiencing God on an ever-increasing level, 
is blessed despite their circumstances. We tend to think that we will only be blessed if our circumstances are perfect in life. And let me fill you in on a little secret. If you're waiting for that, for you to experience blessing, you will never be blessed because things will never be perfect in your life long term. Look at what Jesus said who is blessed. In Matthew 5, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, this Part of the kingdom is different than what we assume blessed is. We assume blessed just simply means to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right? One week, amen, for that one. Time to get real. But to be part of this kingdom that Jesus is talking about is different than what we assume being blessed really is. I'm talking about something far better, something far greater in life than just simply to have everything go well for us. In this kingdom that God has for us, we can rest because we know our future is secure. I like what Tim Tebow said. He said, I don't know what my future holds, but I do know who holds my future. A person in the kingdom of God can experience rest and they can experience peace and they can experience joy despite the situation, despite the circumstances that they're in. Paul in his letter to the Philippians talked about rejoicing and praying. A person who's in the kingdom of heaven can experience this. He said if they do, if they um, rejoice, uh, spend their time rejoicing and they spend their time praying. He says in Philippians 4, 7, he says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. You see, in his kingdom, there is peace which is greater than you can understand and it will protect your heart and your mind. And I tell you that this is an incredible thing. But you know, it's so easy for us to read verses like Philippians 4, 7, what I just read to you, and we, and we take this as being a formula. You know, so I'm going through my life, and then I lose my job, and now, okay, I'm not happy right now, so what is the solution for me? The solution is that I need to rejoice. Oh God, I thank you that I've lost my job. Come on, we think this way, right? And then we think, who said no? <laughs> so we think what we need to do to get rid of these worries and these cares is we treat this as a formula and we say, okay, now what I need to do is I need to rejoice and I need to pray and then instantly I'm happy. What I've just said is true. But I think we take this too much as being a formula when there's more going on then this is just a formula. You see, the fact is, this kingdom that I'm talking about this morning is a kingdom that progressively go, grows. There's more at play here than just a how-to to live. I'm talking about something that's deeper than just a how-to thing to live. Let's look at another verse in Philippians 4.11. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. I know how to live in poverty or prosperity. No matter what the situation, I've learned the secret of how to live when I'm full or when I'm hungry, when I have too much or when I have too little. You know, you can read this, these verses again and you can take this as a how-to thing. And you think to... Um, 
you can say what needs to happen is you need to learn to be content. And I've preached that. A person does need to learn to be content in whatever situation they're in. But then we take it a step farther, per se, and we think, now what needs to happen for me to learn to be content is I need to have lots and I need to have little to the point where I understand that really neither one of those two things are important, and then I will learn to be content. Again, there's more going on here than meets the eye. What I've said, that we need to learn to be content, is true, but it's only true partially, and I'm not sure it's true in the way that we take this to mean sometimes. Remember what Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to, He's, or the kingdom of God to. I think those two phrases are interchangeable, so I may um, use either of them, but they mean the same thing. In Luke 13, 18, Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I, to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast which a woman took and hid in 60 pounds of meal until all of it was leavened. You know, it's easy to read this verse and to just think, you know, the kingdom of God grows through things like evangelism. So in other words, we do um, what God has called us to do and we share the good news of the gospel and other people catch on and they share the good news of the gospel and the kingdom of, of God grows. You know, that's true too. But when I was studying it this week, I saw that it's more than that. Do you know the kingdom of God grows in you? The kingdom of God grows in you. It's not just, okay, we started with 15 people in the church, which we literally did, and now there's a couple hundred. There's a hundred and, well, there's probably 150 of us here this morning. And then it just grows and grows and grows until all of a sudden um, the church is full to overflowing. I mean, that's partially what it means, but it means more than that. What he's talking about here is the kingdom of God expands in our lives. And so when we start, when we um, give our life to Jesus Christ, it's kind of like, can I get graphic here this morning? It's kind of like when a man and a woman come together and the sperm connects with the eggs and there's, in my mind, there's a flash and there's a new life created. So when you give your life to Jesus Christ, it's kind of like there's a flash and it's like a grain of mustard seed in your life. And this thing will grow and grow and grow and grow until it becomes so big that it encompasses your whole life. You see, theology is wrong when we think when we come to Jesus Christ, He gives us a new heart and a new mind, which He does. But then we think growth is not a process. Growth is a process. There's a process that we go through. So um, our heart is changed. You know what helps with this? I was reading a book this week that I thought was really incredible. You know, we think of Christian life just being a spiritual thing, but you know, it's more than that. You know what you do with your body affects your spiritual life? What you do with your body, think about it. If you train yourself to read Scripture every day, you're doing that with your body, right? If you train yourself to read Scripture every day, you will be implanting the Word of God in yourself and it will change who you are. If you decide that you're just going to do things that you know aren't good and you're going to run and do those things all the time, you're also going to suffer the consequences for that in life. So what you do with your body is important. To grow in the kingdom of God, it is important what you use your body for. Now we don't earn anything, but you know what? 
We don't earn anything as we don't, as in we don't earn God's approval or we don't earn His grace. His grace is a free gift to us. But what we end up doing with ourself makes a difference. And if you want to experience the kingdom of God to the way that I know each one of us want to experience it, it makes a difference how we act. It makes a difference what we do. The kingdom of God grows in us and it's a personal thing. It grows in us. But we need to cooperate with God. As we cooperate with Him, then we will experience the peace that surpasses knowledge. It will grow in us. The learning to be content in whatever situation we're in will grow in us. But it doesn't happen just instantly, so don't give up. Keep pressing in to the things of God. Keep cooperating with God. And you will find out before too long, you're in a far different place than you are now. What I'm talking about is living our life as if Jesus had our life. Do you know that Jesus could have your life right now where you're at and He could live it successfully? And you think, oh yeah, but that's Him, that's not me. You know what? You can live your life right now where you are. You can live your life successfully as well. Because the same spirit that was in Jesus is in you. You know, I think sometimes we all think, and I have to raise my hand to this one too, but we all think we're so hard done by and that things can't possibly work out in our life. Well, they worked out for Jesus. They worked out all the way to the cross. And they worked out to him um, being resurrected from the dead. Jesus could live your life and he could live it successfully. We need to start seeing things that way. You know, in my prayer time before the service this morning, I was reading once again about how Jesus brings us victory in our lives. You know, a guy, needs to, a guy needs to get that stuff sunk deep down into your spirit. You need to understand, you know, in life we don't come from a position of weakness. But when we've given our life to Jesus Christ, we come from a position of strength in our life. And we're more than conquerors, Scripture said, through Christ Jesus who loves us. We need, to, we need to see ourselves that way when we're operating in the power that God gives to us. Does that make sense? What I'm talking about is us cooperating with Jesus. What did Jesus say in John 14, 23? Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. You see, to have this happen, it means we believe and we trust to the place that we know that he knows what's best for us. If you're like me, and I've lived a lot of years, I've lived most of my life wanting what I want. And basically the root of the issue is I'm not trusting that Jesus has my well-being in his hands. That he cares about what's best for me. And you know, carpet didn't work out. There's flaws in the carpet. And this isn't a huge thing for me, it's not. But I'm just using that as an example. We could get it all in a dither about that, right? But you know what? Someday, hopefully not too long, we will have nice new carpet in here that looks really classy and really sharp. But in the meantime, in the meantime, are we going to get in a dither and wreck two months because it looks like this? God knows what he's doing. And I'm not saying that God 
made the carpet manufacturer mess up. I'm not saying that. But I know that whatever situation we're in, we can trust Him. And He will look after the stuff. I mean, this is His building, right? My life is His. And so the problems that I think I have are really His problems. What a better way to live. Understanding that the kingdom of God grows in me and I can just relax and I can enjoy life. And of course, there's things I need to do. I've talked about that already. It's not, I'm not talking about living my life with a TV on, laying on a couch. But what I am saying is I don't need to be in a dither about the results. I can trust in Him for the results. What a better way, what a better way to live. The problem is we vacillate between knowing that God knows best and thinking that we know best. Let me give you an example about what I'm talking about, a simple little example. How many of you know that most people have a drug of choice? I'm not necessarily talking about a a narcotic. But most people, when the stress is on, they have something that they run to to relieve the stress. It might be something like TV. It might be something like pornography. It might be something that's not really bad, or it might be something that is really bad. But we have a tendency to, to, when times get tough, we have a tendency to go to something other than Jesus Christ to to take the stress away. And I'm not saying you shouldn't distract yourself occasionally. But what we need to do is we need to understand that our drug of choice should never replace Jesus. Jesus. That He is the source of our life. He is our strength. He is our source for power. And in whatever situation that we're in, He will help us to be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. So rather than think, you know, I'm in such a desperate situation that what I need to do is to go watch the latest Star Wars movie to bring me relief, What did it say in Philippians? Spend time rejoicing, spend time in prayer, and you will receive peace that surpasses knowledge. You'll have peace, you'll have greater peace than you can understand. So I just use that as a small example that we think we know what's best rather than that God knows what's best for our life, and we prove it by running to something other than Him when we have issues. Look at what James said about people who vacillate between trusting themselves and trusting God. In James 1, 5 and 8, it says, 5 to 8, it says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous Lord and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. When you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. You see, really what a double-minded person does is they vacillate between the two kingdoms. And what do I mean by the two kingdoms? Well, the first kingdom is God and His realm, It's a spiritual kingdom, and God, who is spirit, created what we see in the physical realm. That's the two kingdoms that I'm talking about. One is God and the angels, and the other one is here, now, what we see, what we hear, what we taste. 
And really, a person who is double-minded in James here, the way I see it anyways, is a person who wavers between these two kingdoms on who he can trust, on what he absolutely needs to have a victorious life. This person has a reality issue. He thinks that he can only depend on himself for the answers to his problems. And let me tell you, there are problems that you're going to face in life that don't have any natural answers in this world. There will come a time and a place for each one of us, and some of us have been there, where it doesn't seem like there's any natural solution to the problems that we have. And you know what? There isn't any natural solutions to the problems that we have. But we have a God who lives outside of what we see and taste and touch here. We have a God who lives outside of this realm. And this God can do miraculous things. And that's the God that we're trusting in. The God who can do miraculous things for us. And so we give our life to Him. And we trust that He is going to look after us. Whatever the situation is. And sometimes we don't understand what's going on. Sometimes things in life don't make sense. But we can still trust in Him. We can still trust in Him. That doesn't mean that we just go through life happy. Because there are times when we sincerely need to grieve. I lost my mom when I was 24 years old. That was one of the most stressful times in my life. And I still don't know the why to that. But my life has been blessed in spite of that. And God has done a work in my life and I can trust Him and I can rely on Him. You see, it's not that we're protected from all of these things and we are protected. It's just that we don't understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes sometimes. But we can still trust in our Heavenly Father. I know there's some of you here this morning as I look around, you don't understand what's going on. But I know that there's a God who does understand what's going on. And He will either take you out of the situation or He will make you live successfully in the situation. Your well-being in life does not depend on the situation turning out exactly the way you want it to. That's one side of the story. But the other side of the story is we can trust God in whatever situation we're in. And you know what? You get a bad report from the doctor. You don't have to accept that. And we've got people who are alive here this morning. Pauline, for example, talked to her. Pauline is here and she's alive and she's doing well. And she wasn't supposed to be here, right, Pauline? 2007 is when that, 2010. It's a lady in Claire's home. She's like kind of a mom to me. I really appreciated her. She um, was pronounced with liver cancer a long time ago. And she's still here. You see, we need to come to the place where we are part of God and His kingdom more than we're a part of just what's going on here. We need to have the mindset that it's God and His kingdom and we can trust and rest and rely on Him. God still does miracles today. There was a pastor I know, I hope I haven't just told this story, I hope I at least give three months between stories here. (laughs) 
But there's a pastor, um, Les Barassa, he's pastoring in Grand Prairie right now. When he, if I got the story right, he was, became a Christian and then I think was baptized in the Holy Spirit and went skiing and broke his leg and broke his leg enough that it was on a different angle and they prayed and his leg straightened out and he was healed and Les is not the kind of guy who would make up a story like that Maybe I am, but he's not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Trust me, I'm not. James, to get back to this, is saying that a double-minded person wavers between the two kingdoms. He has a reality issue, and he thinks that he can only rely on himself to get himself out of situations. And he thinks that he must have everything figured out as to how things are going to work physically before we can have peace. James says a person who is wavering between the two kingdoms like that shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. Ouch. But it's not because God is punishing the person. God isn't saying, you sucker, you don't believe that I can handle this situation, so... Um, I'm not going to handle it for you. That's not the situation. What is more the situation is if we're double-minded, we think that we have to solve the issue ourselves, And so we have a receiving problem. We have trouble receiving um, what God wants to give to us. The real issue down to the brass tacks here. The real issue is a person who is double-minded are not sure that they can trust God. They're not really sure that God will look after them in whatever situation they're in. They're not really sure that things will work out for them. And so there is no rest and there is no peace and their lives are anything but blessed. So where are you at this morning? Where are you at this morning? You know, sometimes we need to ask ourselves questions like that. Where are we really at? You know, for myself, I wish I could tell you that um, I'm in a place where I'm completely at peace and at peace. Um, <laughs> that I'm completely at peace and trust in God. And you know what? I'm growing in that. The kingdom of God is growing in me. But just recently, we ordered these chairs. Um, we ordered 215 of them. And they told us when we ordered them, they said that they could come at any time, that they would give us 24 hours notice but that they could come at any time of the day. And so um, we had to have a crew of at least five or six people that was here to help the driver unload the chairs. In fact, they told us not to expect any help from the driver because it actually is, um, because of the union that he's probably a part of, he's not allowed to help load or unload. And so in my mind, in your wise, mature, great pastor's mind, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what if the chairs show up in the middle of the afternoon? I know there's lots of people that would like to help unload chairs, but what if there isn't anybody who would be able to um, help unload? Come on, you guys all look so spiritual, I know you're not like me at all. <laughs> but you know, that was an area of concern. Okay, it was more than an area of concern. It was an area of worry for me. I could just picture Pastor Nick and myself. <laughs> I, I could just see us there trying to do it ourselves. 
Fast forward to this week. The driver phoned us. We had our 24 hours notice. And there was about a dozen people that showed up to unload the chairs. In fact, in about three quarters of an hour, everything was looked after. And you know what? God didn't just do that for me that day. But God supernaturally organized that whole day for me. I won't bore you with all of the details, but I don't know if I've ever experienced a day like that. And I think God was just showing me that he's got everything under control, that I can trust in him. And not only was my day organized on a supernatural calendar, so to speak, but the day ended with a guy telling me, well, just encouraging me and speaking into my life like I have not heard before. That was that day. I'm not saying every day is going to work out like that one did. But I am saying that I can trust Him with every day. And we can trust Him with every day. What a better way to live. And as the kingdom of God grows in us, we can experience His peace and His grace Continually. In closing, who is blessed? It's the person who lives in his kingdom. So the question for us this morning is, are you going to make the choice to live in his kingdom? and watch it grow in your life.